Lord Cornwallis was his junior. The two would famously feud about who was to blame for the defeat at uh, Yorktown. But I, it will suffice here to say that Cornwallis, in fact, went on to have a successful career. He was one of the few young enough to have a post-war career as Lord Lieutenant and Governor General in Bengal, in which he played a major role in the expansion of Bengal into uh, southern India, in which he commanded much larger armies than he would have ever have commanded in America. And the last two chapters deal with naval aspects of the war that are very critical. Uh, the one person that possibly historians wouldn't necessarily expect to find in this book is Sir George Rodney, uh, who is the one person who emerged with his character <coughs> actually enhanced uh, as a result of fighting in the Revolutionary War because he captured or killed three enemy admirals. He killed, and there were three different countries and three different fleets. He killed the Dutch admiral, he captured the Spanish admiral, and he captured Admiral de Grasse, the French admiral who really inflicted the only major <coughs> naval defeat on the British since the 1690s at the Battle of the Chesapeake Capes in September of 1781. Uh, Rodney is in the book because he also played a role, a major role, in the uh, uh, moments leading up to Yorktown, uh, in the what often neglected naval aspect of the final British defeat. And the very last chapter is about the Earl of Sandwich, the first Lord of the Admiralty. After Lord George Germain, he is the civilian uh, politician who was most popular to blame at the time for the war. There was even talk of trying to impeach him towards the end of Lord North's administration. Uh, he is indeed the source of the modern day snack, the sandwich, because he liked to play hard and work hard and put meat between bread. Uh, but sandwich was blamed for the fact that Britain did not have a two power Navy during the American Revolution. The British during the 18th century aimed to have a two-power navy. That was to be able to defeat both uh, France and Spain together. Uh, he's unfairly blamed because even before Lexington and Concord, Sandwich was advising the government to mobilize the entire navy. He had been administering aspects of the navy before other government ministers had been born. And he pointed out that in every war, Britain had always been caught uh, essentially unprepared, and that the Navy had always been defeated in the early period of those wars. Uh, the classic one being the first two years of the French and Indian War. And so he argued for full mobilization. The government instead cut the Navy's budget as part of Lord North's prudence and fear of uh, national debt and the national debt crisis. And so he wasn't able to really start rebuilding the Navy, bringing ships out of dry dock, uh, getting half-paid captains on board their ships until the middle of the war. And by 1782, the Navy was almost on a par although not quite with the French Navy, when in April of 1782, Rodney inflicted a great defeat on de Grasse at the Battle of the Saints, that essentially uh, allowed the British to uh, uh, start negotiating peace terms and to save face and to negotiate separately with France and America. So those are the 10 key characters. Uh, these leaders are often uh, typically the ones that we blame for why the British lost. This is most noticeable in movies and in popular fiction. And I'm going to show you a clip uh, to illustrate this in a moment. Now, 
historians, and especially academic historians, usually don't write to dispute Mel Gibson and the Buddhas. Uh, but I would point out that it makes its way into popular history, the classic example being Barbara Tuckman's, uh, her book, The March of Folly. A third of it is essentially uh, caricaturing this British leadership. She does it very well, incidentally, and you, as she always did, uh, was very effective in using sources. But that book really has to be understood as a book against Vietnam and a book that regarded all war as folly. And it does make its way into academic history. Um, words like hidebound and incompetent are typically used to describe uh, many of the people that I've just discussed. I think, though, that popular history and movies is terribly important because they tell us a lot about the sort of folk psychology and what essentially uh, is the popular idea of what happened during the American Revolution. Now, the clip I'm going to show you is from The Patriot, and I realize you'll think this is a very low move because historians especially were critical of that uh, film. Um, not least Spike Lee, for example, criticized the uh, depiction of slavery in the film. Um, reenactors got very upset that uh, loyalist troops were being depicted wearing red rather than green. A lot of people attacked it. But essentially, the stereotype of Cornwallis in this film is one that you will find in all movies about the American Revolution. Um, a good example would be Al Pacino's Revolution, uh, which was the popular movie before the Patriot. In fact, I would say that the tragedy of the Patriot is it could have been the great film about the American Revolution because there is another figure portrayed, Bannister Tarleton, although they don't give him his historical name, that actually is rather accurate, even though it upset people in Britain. It's um, a reasonably accurate portrayal. Uh, it might have changed the feel of the movie if all the cavalry with him had been portrayed with American accents, because they were, in fact, American loyalists. But uh, let's see how this... General O'Hara, our supply ship appears to have arrived. Uh, yes, 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 my lord, it has. Yes. Then why am I still wearing this rag? My lord, your replacement wardrobe is aboard ship, but uh, Colonel Tavington thought it best to secure our arms and munitions first. Uh, they are being unloaded now. You look good in that color. It stinks. Mm. Yeah, it's at a dead man. Then. The beast took your dogs as well. Yes, yeah. Fine animals, a gift from his majesty. Dead now, for all I know. Is there no decency? <laughs> so in the clip, Cornwallis is more concerned about his sartorial elegance and his dogs than in winning the war. I mean, he's portrayed essentially as being at Drayton Hall, the most magnificent colonial home in America. The real Cornwallis was the most aristocratic of all of the British commanders. He was also the least pretentious. Uh, this is the man who, at Ramses Mill in North Carolina, burnt his entire wagon trail, his um, tents, his equipment, uh, threw away all of the rum rations, and essentially survived as a scavenger army. Um, his commander in chief, Clinton, was appalled at what he saw, as he described as a Tartar army, a barbarian army. Uh, we don't have many. Uh, accounts by private soldiers, but of those we do, uh, they describe Cornwallis as a man they really admired because he suffered the same privations as they did. This is the man who, when he was Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, refused to live 
in the uh, uh, Dublin Castle, and in fact refused to have proper security, as a result of which he was nearly assassinated in Phoenix Park. And he was one of the only governor generals in India who uh, simply put aside a lot of the uh, pomp and ceremony uh, because he essentially disliked it. He was someone who would be remembered as being anti-corruption, who wherever he was refused to uh, receive two salaries uh, and to have a sinecure, and essentially stood for a new ethic in government uh, 